Love it. What about vitamin C, Dr. Chafee? You said you eat a tom tomahawk or a couple of New York strips a day. Uh, there's a little bit of vitamin C in red meat, not much. Do you check your vitamin C levels? Do you take a vitamin C supplement? Do you check vitamin C levels in your patients? If, if yes, why? If no, why? No, I, I don't. I don't check it in my patients. Certainly, um, I don't. I don't think that it's necessary. The thing is, is that vitamin C we need we need much more of it if we're eating carbohydrates because vitamin C gets blocked out uh, from your digestion. Um, they get sucked up by the GLUT4 receptor, as do carbohydrates. And so, you're eating hundreds of grams of carbohydrates. That's going to block out. The milligrams of vitamin C that you're that you're eating, you're not eating the carbohydrates. You're going to take in more of the vitamin C. Additionally, we have to think about what we need vitamin C for in the first place. As in the context of scurvy, now we see this in some of our immune cells or macrophages, etc. But from from the context of scurvy, vitamin C catalyzes a reaction that hydrolyzes proline and lysine so that they can form this alpha helix and, and stick together very tightly. If they're not hydrolyzed, they sort of repel each other. So you get loose collagen, and you get loose connective tissue, and, and you start having bleeds and breaks. You can get aortic dissections and, and have fatal internal bleeds. So it's very dangerous. That's scurvy. But when you are eating enough meat, meat already has hydrolyzed proline and lysine. So you're getting those that substrate already. So you actually skip a step. You don't actually need the vitamin C at all. So you're, if you're eating enough meat and you're getting enough hydrolyzed proline and lysine from the meat, your demand for vitamin C for scurvy and, and collagen production is zero. So it's not even that you need less of it and, and the carbohydrates um, you know, being gone is, is acceptable. Like you don't actually need any of it. Um, I, I, I think of this from um, the perspective of, of the Maasai because the Maasai are carnivores, but they also drink milk and milk has carbohydrates. And so what little vitamin C they're getting from the meat, they're probably blocking out a lot of that no scurvy, right? And so I don't think that that, that caused a problem as well. I actually did uh, a, a self-test with vitamin C, and I just drank, I, drank, I drank like a gallon of raw milk a day for three days, and I tested my vitamin C. It, was, I, it didn't even show up. It was like trace. And I'm like, well, <laughs> that's, that's what that is. So I would imagine that, that the vitamin C levels of the Messiah are actually quite low, so they're doing this long term, and, and they don't seem to have any problems. Exactly. And, and the last time I, I don't check it in patients typically because I agree with you completely. If your diet is low enough in carbohydrates, you're going to get enough vitamin C. It's not an issue. But I checked mine and it was either 0.2 or 0.3, which was obviously low. Uh, but one thing that I mean, Nisha compliments me for lots of stuff, obviously. But one thing that she compliments me on is like she's like, you heal like an Avenger because I'm out in the woods mm -hmm. all the time with the chainsaw, there's briars, there's brambles, there's thorns, there's, you know, sticks mm -hmm. and I'll get huge lacerations or abrasions. And I had a, a big one, a gigantic one on my arm. And like four days later, it was virtually healed and gone. Mm -hmm. And it's, I think it's important for people to understand if that low vitamin C level, if that was really meaningful, mm -hmm. I, I would, it would have taken a month for that to heal. Does that make sense? Because it just, you mm -hmm. can't, your, your connective tissue is not going to work properly if you are truly deficient in vitamin C. And I think Dr. Chafee is exactly right. If you're eating as close to zero carb as you possibly can, there's no, no, there's really minimal, if any need for vitamin C at all. I think you're exactly right. And I know that's a bit controversial to say. We'll probably mm -hmm. get some feedback on that. The, mm -hmm. the one vitamin deficiency that I've seen, and it's super rare, in and it and it's it's in carnivores and it's in carnivores who are mainly lion diet. So either by choice they're eating only ruminant meat or that they just like beef and nothing else. I've seen I think two people with a low B1 thiamine level. Uh, okay. and, and and I was doing some research on this and pork is 10x, 15x higher in B1 than beef. And uh mm -hmm. Both those instances, we added back the, the, you know, I said, eat a pork chop twice a week. That just, that's it. And so they kept eating their beef and they would just add a pork chop once or twice a week. And the B, B1 level went right back up to normal. In both cases, they were having a, a mild neuropathy and that went completely mm -hmm. as well. But that's, that's really the only vitamin uh, defect or de uh, deficiency I've seen at all 
on a carnivore diet, and that's in people who are eating a very focused, narrow carnivore diet. Have you seen any vitamin or mineral deficiencies at all on any of the versions of carnivore? Hmm. Well, that, that's really interesting. Um, it's I, I, not to the extent that they're getting neuropathies or, or any sort of you know, serious like, signs or symptoms of, 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 um, of a deficiency. Um, I typically see people's vitamins and minerals go up, especially if they're, they're not having other sorts of things. I know, I know you like coffee and I, I think coffee is great for a lot of things, but I, I find it um, the anti-nutrient effects of the coffee, I think are, you know, should be considered. I have, I have actually several dozen patients that came in that were on thyroid medication and it showed up that basically they were floridly hypothyroid, both in their numbers and their symptoms. And so we say, okay, what's going on? It, it, it basically was back to where they, before they were, were taking their thyroid medication and they were all still taking it, but it all turned out that they were having coffee basically with their, their medication. And we found out that, yeah, was just blocking it out. And thyroid medication, you know, as you know, is, is very temperamental anyway. You have to take it on its own. You can't take anything else for at least half an hour besides water. But the coffee seemed to, to be a dry, an issue even after half an hour. And so we found out through trial and error that people had to basically wait about two hours before they had coffee or it would significantly reduce the absorption. And, and all of a sudden, their, their numbers were just coming back up. I should probably publish that because there were like dozens of people that did that. But it would be kind of interesting. Yeah. But That'd be a great um, study. Yeah. And, um, but, you know, so I'll see maybe some issues with you know, zinc or magnesium, usually not in a deficient level, but maybe not getting up as high as other people. You know, the, the one thing I do see sometimes, you know, if someone has MTHFR or something like that, they might be a bit, a bit low on, on um, you know, folate or, or B12. Um, and I have actually seen some people that it's, it's no fault of the diet. Um, it's just their, their own genetics. They might need a little bit of liver or something else, but you know, they're not symptomatic, but some that's, that's one marker that I do try to keep track of is because Oxford university published a paper in 2008 that showed that under 500 picomoles per liter, which is 650 or so picograms per milliliter in the U S that people are actually getting demyelination of their, of their white matter. They couldn't, they couldn't keep rebuilding their uh, white matter around their axons, the, the myelin, myelination around their axons, and they actually had a shrinkage in their brain volume by two and a half percent after five years. And that under 307 picomoles per liter, they actually got um, shrinkage by 5.5% after five years. So in, in the, and, and then you see, you know, kids that, um, that have, are B12 deficient, they, they don't get that myelination. They, they look like the MRI of, a, of, a, of an 80 year old. Uh, with significant brain atrophy and then they replace the b12 and it, it plumps right up which is great but um you know just sort of stave that off and, that, and that's the other thing too you know if that looks like an 80 year old we know that's known b12 deficiency well maybe this is not normal age-related atrophy over time maybe this is malnutrition over time and that if your b12 is right bang smack in the middle of the reference range and your doctor says yeah your b12 is fine but it's that 300 and maybe you're losing 1% of your brain volume per year. After 30, 40 years, you're going to look like that 80-year-old atrophied patient. So I do sort of track that one. I, I, I'd like to keep keep on top of that. Also, that can help metabolize homocysteine. And if you get elevated homocysteine, that can be a cardiovascular risk um, or, and uh, atherosclerotic risk. And so I saw some people, typically B12 goes up, folate goes up, or all these nutrients go up. And a couple of people are just persistently lower B12 even after I've given him an injection. And so he said, okay, maybe you have MTHFR, why don't you add in some liver? And they add in liver three days a week, doesn't budge. I'm like, all right, what else is going on? And so I checked them for pernicious anemia antibodies and actually they were positive. So I've, I've actually diagnosed three or four people with pernicious anemia because if you're just eating red meat and you're eating liver three days a week, like you should not have any problem with your B12. Correct. And so they're, they're definitely getting enough in their, in their food. Uh, but they weren't. And so uh, they actually had pernicious anemia. So they actually were, were positive for that. And so um, that's, that's, that's just good to know. And so I think that it's a good idea to sort, just sort of check these things. Even if sort of, it, it's hard too, because you feel so much better and you're improving in so many ways that you, you don't necessarily realize you should be held back by something. And, but, but I've had people come in after a year or two on carnival and say, look, I feel 90% better than I ever have but I feel that there's still something missing there. And this lady in particular, she was a professor of nursing and um, you know, now retired. And she, she felt that, that way. And, and we found out 
sure enough, she actually had some nutritional deficiency. She had, she had malabsorption issues. She just could not get these things in through her, her gut. And so we had to, we had to look at other things too, had pernicious anemia, for example. Um, so I've seen some things like that too.